Hey guys, welcome to the First Impressions Conference. We are so glad you are joining us today. We are kicking things off with my friend Carrie Newhoff. Carrie pastors in Canada, uh, Connexus Church, and so uh, we wanted to start things off with a message specifically to pastors and to those that lead their congregation. A lot of pastors uh, are the only person on staff. Uh, they may oversee everything. And so uh, we are very sensitive to that. We realize that uh, you may be the only one leading your team. And so we wanted to talk straight to you today. And so, Carrie, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, Greg. Thanks for doing this, and thanks for having me. Yes, and so like I said, today we're, we're going to just try to encourage pastors. I think there will be a, a number of staff members that listen to this from communications people to worship to children's to guest services, team leaders, but everybody can uh, be encouraged and uh, equipped through what we're going to talk about the entire conference. But today we wanted to start a little more broad picture, kind of uh, visionary. Um, so as you lead a congregation, as you have led over your career and over your, over your years in ministry, uh, start with the why. Why do first impressions matter when you're leading a congregation? Well, I think everybody, you know, they, there's that old saying, Greg, uh, never judge a book by the cover. But the reality is we do. I mean, if you were car shopping, we live in a consumer driven culture. If you're car shopping, kind of look at the design, you kind of look at the reviews. Um, that's that's just what we do. And it also creates a certain feeling when you walk into a place. I mean, the way we do ministry, for the most part, for those of us listening, is in a facility. And sometimes that facility is portable, sometimes it's permanent, sometimes it's old, sometimes it's brand new. Um, but you pick up a vibe and you pick up a feeling, an emotion when you walk into a place. In the same way that if you were to come to my house or I was to come to your house, um, you know, you, you, you really want to make your guests feel welcome. You want to make them feel comfortable. You want to let, you know, we had friends over last night and you make sure they get their shoes off and you take their coats and you hang them up and you offer them something to drink and you show them where to sit down and you make sure that you're really interested in them and, and you ask questions. And so I think for all those reasons, as long as they're human beings, as long as we have some kind of social interaction, first impressions make a huge difference. Even, you know, the way I, people are seeing this, this is my office and we built it out this way last year or the year before, and I wanted to create a meeting space. So if four of us got together, you know, it was like, well, do we put a couch in here? Uh, couches are great for naps, but no, we didn't put a couch in here because I wanted individual chairs. So when my team gathers or I have leaders in, you know, we got a place to sit. It's comfortable. Uh, hopefully it's, it's attractive and it's clean. And so you just want to put people at ease so that they, they feel like they're in a place where they can just have the conversation they need to. And in our case as church leaders, you know, the conversation they're going to have is with God. And yeah. so if you've got all kinds of things that are distracting them and bothering them, or they have a bad feeling about the place, you've just interfered with their ability to connect with Christ. And I, I think that's important. It is. It is. And you mentioned, you know, even your office, you're kind of creating an environment or an atmosphere uh, that is intentional and that is by design. Uh, how should church leaders approach uh, their facility? And like you said, whether it be portable or a hundred year old building, um, what are some little things that pastors and staff members should look out for um, as they get ready, you know, maybe an hour or two before the service, maybe throughout the week as they prepare, what are some little things that they can look for and prepare for for these guests that are going to come? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Greg. And for me, I've led in all of those contexts. I've led in 100 to 120 year old buildings. I've led in schools. I've led in brand new multi-million dollar permanent facilities, our current broadcast location for Connexus Church. So I kind of feel like in the 22 years I've been in ministry, all through the same church as we've grown and moved and changed, uh, we've been in almost every situation 
situation that anybody watching this event would be familiar with. So, you know, this this applies whether you have millions of dollars or dozens of dollars or no dollars. But um, some real simple things like I'm a bit of a neat freak, but like even if you're in a hundred year old building, did anybody vacuum carpets? Is are, are the walls scuffed? Um, you know, is the nursery area where you take kids? And listen, I mean, I'm not talking now we have like preschool and Wombaland and Upstreet. I mean, it's super fancy and themed and we sunk hundreds of thousands of dollars into it. But I go back 22 years to when I started in the original mainline churches I was a part of. And I mean, it's a 120 year old building that's only heated on Sundays. Um, the kids ministry is basically a series of play pens in the back room. But it has to be the best back room that you have. And you may not have a lot of money, but like, is there a fresh coat of paint? Is, did somebody vacuum the carpet? Are the toys disinfected? Yeah. Um, did, you know, are the pews dusted? We had pews in those days, right? In the, this case, are the chairs aligned? Or does it look like a great big accident that nobody's paid attention to? Those are really important. And, and if you think that's like, you know, completely unspiritual, I don't think it's unspiritual at all. Oh, I think, you know, if, if you look at, I mean, we're not a temple culture, but Old Testament temple regulations, the hospitality of the early church, the warmth and the invitation into your home, you see those principles all over scripture. And I think we should do our best for God. And if people push back against that, I mean, just think about going to a restaurant. I mean, if you walk into a restaurant, it's dirty. Uh, the floor is a mess. It looks like somebody picked your French fly, fries up off the floor. Or, um, you know, one thing my wife does, and I think she's smart to do this, but if the bathroom is a mess, she assumes the kitchen isn't a whole lot better. Like if your public areas are not that good, what are your private areas looking like? Like you make up your mind as a restaurant guest, whether you're going to go back to that restaurant a lot of the time before you have your first bite of food. And so I think churches operate in the same way. And far be it from me to want to get in the way of uh, somebody coming into a relationship with Christ. Now, sometimes can you take it over the top? Yes. When we built our facility a couple of years ago, we wanted to make sure that it was beautiful but not ostentatious, that it was accessible but not pretentious, that it was well-designed and beautifully created, but not to the point where people went, whoa, that's opulent. You know, so, I mean, you come and you see well-polished concrete, you see drywall that's clean, you see ceilings that are open, but like painted, you know, it's got that, that sort of girder look and you see things that are well signed, but nothing's over the top. It's just clean, neat and functional. And I think that's a really good vibe to hit as a church. And if you got an older church, um, get a fresh coat of paint, make sure that, you know, the carpets are clean, make sure that the bathrooms and the toilets are spotless, make sure they have have all those things done because then you've taken all the objections out of the way and you've made your guests feel comfortable. That's great. That's great. And I hope to visit your, uh, your church one day. I want to see, uh, your campus. Uh, you oh, we can get better. I promise you yeah. that. And, and you of all people would be able to tell us how to do that. No, sure. I just love to love to visit there. Um, I, uh, you met, you mentioned about having a broadcast campus and God has done some amazing things at Connexus church. Uh, when did you guys start? Uh, what was what was your plant date? When when did you become a church? Yeah, so we're 10 years old. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary, and we started with two locations and a theater. We're now three locations with a broadcast campus and two portable locations, plus an online footprint as well. So we started 10 years ago in December of 2017, and we started in a theater, which is which is good and bad. I mean, there's a lot of portable church people watching this right now, Greg, but, um, you know, hey, we had to hire our own cleaning crew to come in first thing in the morning because, you know, Everybody went in there to watch the Star Wars movie on a Saturday night. And there's popcorn all over the floor and your feet stick to the floor. So we have a cleaning crew of our own that we would bring in. And you kind of transform that environment from a theater into a church. And uh, we really believe those environments are important. So we would invest in that. But that's how we started. Yeah. And how did you set that expectation? Like a lot of times people will look at a church like Connexus and others and say, well, they're they're a mega church. You know, they they've got it together. Whereas uh, we actually for this conference, we have a bonus track for church planners and we're going to dive mm -hmm. into the nitty gritty of church planning. 
But for those that are watching this live right now, uh, you haven't always been a mega church. And so in the early days, in the early days, when you, when you had this, this, this dream, this vision of launching Connexus Church, how did you communicate where you were headed, where, where you were going, and set up the standards and the principles of we are going to be this kind of church, even though we're small, you could kind of probably see where you were headed. How, how did you communicate that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because I have been here. Connexus is 10 years old, uh, but with some of the same people who started Connexus, I was part of a mainline church for 12 years prior to that. So I've been in this area actually this year almost 23 years. And some of those same original people in the small churches are, are still with us today. So uh, to give you context, if you think your church is small, uh, where I started 23 years ago, uh, one of the three churches I was at, and I would do the circuit on Sunday morning, had six people at it, <laughs> another had 14, and the gigantic mega church had 23. So wow. these were like little tiny churches. Everybody could meet in my office. Like it was super small. And I was working out of the basement of our house, our house at the time. And, you know, it was an unfinished basement and I had an Ikea desk from when I was a teenager and there was an area rug and a concrete floor and stud walls. Like that, that is, that was my office because the churches weren't even heated during the week or air conditioned, nor did they have a phone. And this was pre-cell phone in the nineties. So, I mean, it was, it was a pretty modest beginning. And I, I think you just start with where you are, like people. And I think you know, what we're doing today is awesome and podcasts and blogging and books and conferences. I mean, yeah, I love the age we're in, but sometimes it works against us when we think, well, if I had the resources of Life Church or North Point or Elevation, then, you know, I would have that kind of ministry too. You just have to start where you are. So, I mean, at the Church of Six, there were two leaders, Doug and Gwen. And Doug and his wife, Doug was in his 70s. He would come in every week with the vacuum and like clean the church. Now, that church was polished, but it had no people. So there the challenge was we had to start casting vision for, hey, there has to be more than six of you who need the gospel in this community. What can we do? And that church grew to about 30 before we amalgamated them. And then the church of 14, um, same thing. You know, they, they were people that just had a couple of young people, and I pulled those young people in. And I'm like, okay, let's start building the future of the church. And we did visioning exercises, and that church grew to about 70 or 80 before we amalgamated. And then the church of 23, uh, same thing. A lot of people were older, but we found the best and the brightest in the church. We pulled them together, formed a visioning team, and that church grew to about 100, 130 within the first few years. Then we took all three churches, we amalgamated them, and we moved to the public school. By that time, when we moved, we had about 150 people. That doubled to about 300 people. Then we moved into our first new building, and there it grew to about six or 700 people, and then we sort of started over again with Connexus. And, you know, not everybody came, so it dropped down to 300 or so, and now we're like 12, well, with our new campus, we'll be closer to 1,500 and three locations. We welcome 2,700 people at Christmas this year. So, you know, but you start with what you have and everyone's like, we don't have any leaders. Man, when you got six people, you got no leaders. Like, you know, you got nothing. Yeah. And so you just find, okay, who are the people that we think we can build the future of the church on? And you start there and you cast vision and you pray and you serve together and you reach out to your friends and, you know, God gave the growth. It's, it's incredible. Incredible. So, you know, I don't think facility should be an excuse to church health and church growth. I don't think size should be an excuse for church health or church growth. And I definitely don't think location should be. I mean, those churches are all within a 10 minute drive of my house. I'm in my house. Um, you know, I've still lived in the same community for 23 years. Uh, I live in the middle of nowhere, man. Like there's, you know, a city of 130,000 to the south, city of 30,000 to the north, but like nothing grows here. And uh, we did because God was present and God was changing people's lives. And so I think you have to look for where the life is. That's awesome. That's awesome. I agree. Um, now, fast forward 10 years, uh, Connexus, mm -hmm. like you said, is, has the, the attendance that you mentioned and you had you just... You had a great uh, Christmas this past year. Um, what is it that you would say you do well, and what is the culture like for guest services at your church, for uh, even children's ministry? When people come and they drop their kids off, what is the culture like? And and just if if you could just take a moment as the founding pastor and brag on your mm -hmm. church, what is it you guys do well? 
Well, um, one thing we decided just before we launched Connexus, because the church that I led before that, which was called Trinity, a lot, a lot of the same people, um, you know, not everyone stuck with us at Connexus. I get that. But uh, we became a program based church. And then we started reading Simple Church, the seven practices of effective ministry. I'd read Good to Great. We really started wrestling with the question, Greg, of uh, what, to use Jim Collins's phrase, what can you be best in the world at? Like, what do you think you, you, because you, you can't do all things well. Right. So we just thought we had a shot at being best, maybe not in the world, but in our community, at creating an experience that unchurched people love to come into, you know? And so we signed up with North Point and became a North Point strategic partner, which was an incredible invitation that Andy and Reggie joined at the time and David McDaniel extended to us. So we have been singularly focused for over a decade now on how do we become best in the world, best like this is the thing we can do to create an experience for unchurched people. And what we learned early on is we had a gift to be able to pull off great events that, you know, if we were going to do a Sunday morning, we were going to do a great Sunday morning and we were going to be able to do a great Sunday morning for kids, for teenagers and for adults. Now, if you go back to our, (laughs) we've taken it all offline because it's so embarrassing. If you go back to our video church from 2007, dude, these were like Best Buy handy camps that we were using. We didn't have any money. We were a church plant, right? right? But now we got like broadcast or almost quasi I broadcast quality cameras. We got an amazing stage. We've got, you know, we sunk, I don't know, half a million dollars into AVL. But we started with handy cams and you build up. And so our adult experience, the band, I mean, we used to have to have conversations about can the band pull this song off? And often the answer was no. Well, now they can pull off anything from, you know, chain smokers through to uh, the latest Bethel music song or elevation worship song. So, you know, we've been able to create that, but you build that up over time. And then our guest services team just does an unbelievable job welcoming people. We added a parking team before we really had a parking issue. Right. We just, just to welcome people, right? And let them know that we're here. Because even if you come to visit Connexus, we ended up uh, leasing out half of basically a strip mall, an industrial commercial strip mall. It was new construction, but we built out the whole interior. So it's not evident that it's a church. Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, you're in suburban Barry, and then you run this thing called Connexus. And before that, we were at the Galaxy Cinemas, which is like our AMC or Regal or whatever. And, you know, everybody knew where the cinema was, but it wasn't clear that a church was meeting there. So we put our signs out, our flags out, and the experience starts in the parking lot. So we do that. And then we've, I, I think our, our, we've spent a lot of money on portable signage over the years. And again, you start with a thousand dollars, but you build yourself up to ten thousand. So it's pretty clear: families go here, and adults go here, and teenagers go here. And we call our environments like most North Point churches, you know, Wombland Upstreet. But we don't say that up front. It's like birth to grade four, or, you know, it wouldn't be birth to grade four. I don't know what it would be, but you know, the sign is clear so that somebody walking in isn't like, what's a wah, wah, ba, wumba, what is that? Right, right? right. So it's pretty clear. Everybody knows birth to grade four. Everybody knows grade five to eight. Everybody knows, you know, and so it's just, oh, these kids go here. Those kids go there. We have a great check-in um, process that's all digital now. And, you know, but it starts with safety and security and letting parents know. And then we try to, the rule that I've, if I've done one thing for guest services, I've said over the years, you should greet people the way they want to be greeted. You know, it's almost like an extension to the golden rule because you have your guest services, people who just want to hug everybody. Right. Well, not everybody wants to be hugged. And then and then you have people who are like really formal and reserved. Well, some people actually do want to hug. And so we try to get emotionally intelligent people who have a pretty good sense of that. We also uh, created a next steps. I forget what we call it right now. We keep changing the name. But um, this kiosk where you can go for next steps. I think we just call it next now. And basically we have like a, a, a version of an apple bar genius who can just, who knows the whole model of the church. And it's like, so Greg, you know, we're glad to have you at Connexus. Um, 
you know, wonder what a next step would be for you. Now, these days we're channeling everyone to an environment that we call next, but it could be like, oh, you've never been baptized here. We got a couple of uh, computers there. Let me, let me show you how to get set up for baptism. Or, oh, you made a decision to follow Jesus. Great. We want to follow up with you. Can you come over here? We'll get your information. So, you know, some people who are really intuitive that way and can follow up with people. So I, I would say our church does a great job of just orienting people. And I'll give them all the credit because, you know, I, I, I released them years ago to do a far better job than I could do. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, as our uh, pastor here uh, at this conference, uh, there's a couple pastors are going to speak, but you're kicking things off. As you speak to other pastors, I want, I want to talk about three things in particular. And the first one, uh, I got to hear for the first time last fall, you and I uh, were both together in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Arms yeah. Conference. And I got to hear Andy Stanley talk about they're in the room and it just blew me away. Now you have heard this talk way more than I can, so I'm not even I'm not even going to attempt to do it. But in just a few minutes, maybe five minutes, can you give us an overview of kind of where what where what that means and what Andy was getting? Yeah. At? Andy's phrase that he's using uh, is assume they're in the room. So when you're talking about unchurched, when you're talking about post-Christian, pre-Christian, however you want to phrase it, uh, his point is simply assume they're in the room. And, you know, long before I met Andy, I still remember the day that we were in an elementary school. This is pre-Connexus. The year was 2001. And I remember we were just hitting that inflection point to where there were new people showing up every day and or every weekend. And I remember thinking while I was standing on stage looking over this, wow, it is not just the usual suspects that every single Sunday is somebody's first Sunday, which we now have on a, on a you know, plaque on our wall or a decal on our wall. But I remember having that thought consciously in the middle of a service, and I never forgot that moment. So that's like 18 years ago, 17 years ago, I had that thought. And I have taken as a communicator really seriously the fact that these are not just the people who grew up in church. These are not just the people that are going to be here last week and next week, that every every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday, and you never want to forget that. So for me, assuming they're in the room, I'd tried to do that even prior to that in the 90s, but when we hit that inflection point where every single Sunday, and I don't think there's been a Sunday in 18 years since that point where we have not had a first time guest. I think, you know, and they don't all stick. And, you know, you've talked about that. You're an expert on that. And, and that's not a sign of disaster, but like there's always someone new in the room. And so I'm preparing a sermon series right now that launches in two weeks. I'm assuming that they're in the room. I've got to, I've got to make that assumption. And I can't just say, as you know, hey, King David, as everybody knows, or, right. you know, hey, you guys all know the story of the Good Samaritan. Well, no, they don't. We got people who've never read their Bible and never even heard the cultural reference. So I have to communicate and we have to facilitate an experience that assumes that somebody, they're, they're intelligent. So I've always put it this way. Assume intelligence, not background. Yeah. Don't pretend they're stupid. Hey, Greg, you know, you probably never read your Bible. Shame on you. Well, if you did, you would know. No, that that is not the way to go. The way you go is, you know, there's a story in the Old Testament about a king. He was one of the greatest leaders that lived before Jesus. His name was David. And he had some good moments and some bad moments. And we joined David in one of his good moments today before he became king while he was waiting to be king. You ever waited to become, you know, for something, waited for a wedding, waited for a job, waited for the first day at school or whatever. Well, that's where David's at. And we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter blank, 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 blank. So that gets everyone in the room. It doesn't make you feel insulted. It doesn't make you feel dumb. It doesn't make you feel, you know, excluded because you don't have a Bible. You know, the reason people don't bring a Bible is because they don't have one or they've got some 17 pound Bible their grandfather gave them, you know, from when they died or whatever from the funeral home. That's why they don't have a Bible. And so don't make them feel dumb about it. Make them feel glad that that uh, that they're there and make them feel part of the story. So to me, in what Andy is talking about when he says assume they're in the room, that's what it's all about. Every Sunday is somebody's first Sunday. 
Yeah, I love it. And you you went to write what I wanted to talk about, and that's preaching to a post-Christian audience. But you said something in passing that's key. And when I work with churches, I say this over and over and over, and that is never assume people know anything. And uh, the best example I, I've had of, with this happened twice, actually, with churches I was working with. And both said pretty much the same thing. The pastor was preaching and he started to mention something in the direction of his testimony. And he said, well, you guys all know my story. And then he went on and went oh, on to yeah. something else. And I'm thinking, no, I don't know your story. I don't know your testimony. And so never never assume. And, and like you said, if you're going to assume, assume they are in the room and that um, – and that uh, it's somebody's first time there. So when you are preaching to a post-Christian audience, uh, one of the things, one of the talks I got to hear Andy Stanley last fall talk about is even the way we present uh, a sermon. And and uh, I, w- I want to hear you. J- you touched on this lightly, but if you could just uh, share a couple of examples. Andy Stanley talked about um, there's sometimes a uh, a defense. Uh, that goes up when people hear, well, the Bible says. And so he he came up with this way of preaching that has really worked well for him, where he would say, hey, there's this guy, his name's Apostle Paul. He actually wrote most of the New Testament. Paul says, or there's this guy, James, he was Jesus's brother. Isn't that amazing to think that you are the brother of the Son of God? And James had to say, you know, but it was just the way that he phrased it. Uh, as you as you are still a teaching pastor at Connexus, mm-hmm. when you assume that they're in the room, how do you phrase things as a communicator? Because again, this talk is primarily hitting pastors and preachers and teachers of the word. How do you phrase things knowing that they are in the room? And and would you? Yeah, in a very similar way. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, and what what are your thoughts? You and I have talked about this offline, but about Christianese, when when people right. use some big, huge theological terms, and even worse, when they don't explain them. But what what are your thoughts on preaching in a in a post Christian world? Well, I think preaching in a post Christian world, clarity is one of the most important values you can have. Um, you know, clarity. The, one of the <laughs> Andy gets it, we get it. You know, people say, "Oh, your preaching isn't deep." But no, it's clear actually. And deep does not equal confusing. Sometimes a really simple truth can be very penetrating, but people will not understand the truth if you don't express it clearly. So, I would say the most important thing is clarity and simplicity. There's there's some Simplicity on on the front side of complexity, and then there's simplicity on the other side of complexity. And I think the best preaching, and Andy embodies this, I think, exceptionally well. Um, you know, he gets something as simple as assume they're in the room, and you think, well, it rhymes. That, that's so superficial. It's not superficial, actually, because, you know, simplicity on the front side of complexity means you haven't thought through the issue. It takes somebody, and Einstein said this, it, it takes somebody really, really smart to work through a very complicated issue. And then get to the other side and to be able to state it clearly. To me, that's the bullseye. I don't hit it all the time, but I look at it this way, Greg. I call it the street test in my head. If I met you on the street, how would I be able to express an idea? If I, in the pulpit, start using language and terms and phrases and even tone of voice that I wouldn't use if I'm talking to you on the street, then I'm probably losing you. And, um, you know, so you really need to be clear. I don't want anyone to walk out of a service that I lead and have them say, I have no idea what that was about. Now, I don't mind if they walk away and they disagree with me. I don't mind if they walk away and they're like, wow, that was hard or that hit heavy. But I want them to understand it. And so my job, and I'm working through a series right now. I've been working on this series for a couple of months. And it's actually based on a, a book a friend of mine wrote called Problem of God. And so when we're recording this a couple months in advance of the event, I'm kicking that off in two weeks. I've been like working through apologetics issues and science versus faith, you know, the false dichotomy. And your head is just scrambled for months while you're thinking about, well, do I go this way? Do I go that way? And then there are simple phrases that that you can pick up that can bring clarity to it. Like, for example, um, I haven't got in front of me, but like, you know, follow where the evidence leads, not where you hope it will lead. 
or uh, you know an Alistair McGrath co quote that is um, fact-based science is not perpetually at war with faith-based religion a lot of people think it is it's not um, you know or maybe the Bible is more passionate about why and who rather than what and how on the whole science versus creation debate you know that's that's a phrase that after books and books and hours and hours wrestling it down it's like you know Genesis 1 and 2 they're really about why and who. They were never intended to be about what and how. Right. And all of a sudden people see that. Now, that simplicity on the other side of complexity, um, but you gotta, you got to wrestle. you got to do your homework. And I think that's actually the job of every communicator. When you get clarity on the other side of complexity, that's when the real magic happens. That's when people go. And we get this all the time. People are like, you know, because not everybody, about 60% of the people who come for the first time are unchurched. But we get some lifelong church attenders, and they'll say, I've learned more about the Bible and faith and Christianity in six months than I have in six years or 60 years attending other churches. And that's what I want. And I just don't want them to know. I want them to live. I want them to surrender. I want them, you know, in a place where their life is trusting Christ for who he is. So um, you got, you hit a passion point of mine. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. That's awesome. Well, we are uh, winding down for the time. I just want to talk real briefly, uh, two memories. If you could share a story, mm. one would be what is your first memory of church? Uh, if you can, as far back as you can remember going to church. And then lastly, uh, when was the last time you visited a church and what was that like? So maybe the first time and the most recent time that comes to mind, of, or maybe just in the last several years of your ministry, a time that sticks out of visiting a church. And you don't have to name yeah. them, but what are some memories? So First memory of church. Anybody who's got a Dutch background will appreciate this because that's what Newhoff is Dutch. So my family's all Dutch immigrants. I was born in Canada, but uh, peppermints. So and it, you know, every time when the sermon started, my mother or grandmother would get a roll of king peppermints, unwrap them. And you could hear everybody did this. Everyone in the church did this little tiny Dutch church. And we'd all get a peppermint. And that was basically like shut up for the sermon. All right. And stop fidgeting. And I would always be the guy to shake the whole, you know, get my leg going and shake the whole row. And it was like, be quiet now. So that's my first memory. And and it was interesting because I think the lesson in that is that church was something to be endured, not enjoyed. And, you know, fortunately, I think I get the opportunity of being part of a church that people enjoy is more than endure. And, you know, if you think that's completely consumeristic, just go back to the Westminster Catechism. And I think the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Right. So that's 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 an ancient concept, not a modern concept. So I think you can enjoy God. And uh, Jesus called us his friends and uh, he said he'd be with us. So I think that that can be a good thing. So that's my first memory. Um, honestly, I'm almost never away from Conexus. I'm there all the time. So I'm not a church shopper. I don't go visiting that often. And lately, because I'm so fascinated with the digital world, when I get a break on a Sunday, I'll tend to be online with some other church right. or our church. However, uh, a year or two ago, I was at National Community Church, and that's in Washington, D.C. with Mark Batterson and his team. I've been there for a couple of Sundays, and they just blew me away. They have a, such a good way of... Um, you know, Mark's very clear. He's a brilliant author, a great communicator. But their whole team has a way of facilitating experiences and encounters with God that's really, really stuck with me. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed that. I was at a conference. It wasn't a church service, but it was like a conference with 700 people. And Elevation Worship led. And like literally, I'm from here to the computer screen from the stage with Elevation Worship leading and like tears streaming down my face. I don't know. There's something about them yep. that is just, and I've talked to friends who, I mean, I met the band, but I've, I've talked to friends who know them and they're, I don't know, God's doing something at Elevation Worship that is really kind of cool and unique. And like, what is that transcendence? I felt it at NCC. I felt it with, um, you know, I've been with Bethel Worship too. I've been done events with them and then with Elevation 
Reformation worship. There's something there that's really, really cool that I'm trying to port back to our church at Connexus. So it's that tension, and I've written about it this year, but between imminence and transcendence, Mm -hmm. that God is both. And I think our churches tend to be too imminent or too transcendent. In other words, imminent is God with us. Uh, you know, Calvin would talk about the doctrine of accessibility, the do- sorry, the doctrine of accommodation, that God accommodates us and he speaks to us in a way that a m- nursing mother lisps to her baby so we can understand it. So God is known, you know, that's the bullet point side of me. That's the clarity side of me. But there's and I probably lean more toward the imminent side. Like, let's just make this practical. Let's make it real. Everybody understand. Good. That's imminent. But transcendence is something else. Transcendence is the supernatural. Transcendence is in the Old Testament, the priest can't continue the service because the holiness of God and the, the, the Shekinah glory descend and like yeah. people are without words or Ezekiel sees, or sorry, Isaiah sees God and like can't speak and falls to the ground as though dead. It's revelation. Now, you know, there's some churches like, oh, we're all about that. Great. But you're going to lose a guest in the midst of all that, whatever you do. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's actually not God. It's just weird. Um, but there is an authentic transcendence and imminence that when they come together, I think reflects the character of God. And uh, that's what I have experienced when I've been in other places lately that's really got me going, hmm, how do you how do you facilitate? Because you can't engineer, you can't manipulate, but how do you facilitate an experience uh, that reflects the character of God in that it is in moments imminent and in moments transcendent? Because I think people people don't want to leave just saying, oh, I understood that. They want to leave saying, I think, I think God is real. Yeah. And I think I met him there today and I don't even know what that means. Like that's the kind of experience I want to facilitate moving forward. Yeah. And I've said that for years. People should have an encounter with the living God. God is Mm -hmm. alive and well. And, uh, you know, I talked about on your podcast one time that excellence transcends. Uh, I've been to NCC. My home church actually is Elevation Church. That's where I go here. Yeah in the Charlotte area, so I get to hear Elevation Worship every week. But when when I've worked with churches around the country, what I have found is um, when when people, as the Bible says, play skillfully, and when there's a value of excellence mixed with the presence of the Holy Spirit, where where God moves. And when when I do a consultation, I always look for the God moment. When do I stop evaluating? When do I take off my secret shopper hat? And just be overwhelmed with the presence of God. And oftentimes there is, like you said, that balance. And something transcends. Um, I I think it's a beautiful thing. But I do think there is, if I could get on a little bit of the practical side to those watching, I think there is something to the value of excellence and doing things with excellence and taking things seriously when it comes to the weekend experience. And so... Uh, you know, I said on your podcast last year, excellence transcends. And so whether you're a traditional church or a blended church or a modern church, uh, small church, large church, if you do things with excellence, um, I, I, I'm passionate about removing roadblocks and barriers and stumbling blocks and in just letting God show up and do his thing. Like I said, we want to encounter the living God. We can't manufacture it. We can't conjure it up. Um, but there are some sweet times where we just encounter God and God does his thing. Um, and then there are moments, uh, you know, I think back a, a, a book that kind of shook me to my core well over a decade ago was Sally Morgenthaler's Worship of Evangelism. Oh, yeah, Worship of Evangelism. Yeah, because there's something powerful. You mentioned being that close to elevation worship and tears streaming down. Well, you're a Christ follower. Imagine if you're in the room, and I get to experience this every week at elevation. Imagine if you're you're an invited guest. You come to church. You're not sure about about all this. And then you meet the living God. Um, you, you are looking around, watching people worship and seeing that something is real. It's genuine. It's authentic. And um, it's just amazing. We serve a great God. And it's just amazing yeah, we do. to see how he moves, how he changes lives. God saves people. We don't do it. And so um, as we close, is there one thing, if you could say one thing to a pastor that's watching this, tuned into the conference, and you want to encourage them when it comes to 
uh, first impressions and guest services and welcoming newcomers to their church, what would you end with? I'll probably say people come to your church and my church every week hoping to meet God. And unfortunately, sometimes they just meet us. Hmm. And that's in the preaching, that can be in the music, but it can also be in the building. If the building back to where we started is so dirty or the bathrooms are so poorly, you know, maintained that it's just it's just really, really um, we got in the way. And so what can you do to get yourself out of the way so that you're clear enough that they understand, um, but you've created enough space for God to move so that your facility is, is really, it's like, you know, what is the definition of good sound? We didn't do AVL here, but good sound is sound that nobody notices, right? right? What is the definition of good lighting? Lighting that nobody really notices. It just, it just works, right? What's the definition of good video and good switching? Video that nobody really notices at the end of the day. Right. And so I got to kind of get out of the way so that people can have that encounter with God in a poorly run, poorly organized, dirty facility, a jumbled message, uh, misrehearsed worship. You know, you're right. That excellence transcends. Um, those are the things that will move people in. And, you know, when people come looking for God, let them find God. Don't let them find you. That's awesome. Kerry, thank you so much for encouraging church leaders and being one of our featured speakers here at the First Impressions Conference. We are honored that you poured into us today. Thank you. Well, thanks for what you're doing, Greg. I really appreciate you. Looking forward to having you back on my leadership podcast in 2018. And thanks for doing this event. And thanks to all of you who are leading churches. You guys are doing a great job. And uh, we're always better together, aren't we? We are. We are. More First Impressions Conference coming soon. Thank you.